Hello. In this video, we're going to look at the construction and the functioning of a diffusion cloud chamber. We will look at various different radioactive sources to uh, see how the tracks from the radiation appear in the cloud chamber. We will try to uh, describe the differences between the tracks and we will explain a little bit about the radioactive sources themselves. Here's a table of contents in case you want to jump ahead to see what you're interested in. Here is the setup for our cloud chamber device, which uh, we're going to explain in some detail. The overview is that there's a cold surface right here that's provided by a um, thermoelectric device that sits underneath this uh, three-inch diameter aluminum plate. This um, heat sink underneath is a computer CPU type uh, cooling device that takes away the heat from the uh, surface here via the thermoelectric device which is uh, underneath this plate. Uh, the uh, cloud chamber itself is uh, a clear plastic container that the bottom of which has been spray painted black. Uh, it has a clear plastic lid through which we'll observe the uh, particles. We will be using a pin type alpha and beta source, a um, source that uh, consists of radioactive lead 210, as we'll see uh, how that goes together in a few minutes. The um, chamber has inside of it some, something we think is somewhat innovative. It's a nearly invisible clear plastic ring that is going to help stabilize the uh, convection currents of the supersaturated vapor to give a smooth, clean gas flow that will make the uh, tracks look crisp and, and clean. There's a um, felt ring that we will be um, impregnating with uh, about a milliliter of uh, alcohol in order to provide the uh, material for the supersaturated vapor. And uh, there is a uh, ring here that has uh, light emitting diodes around the inner circumference that will be placed over the chamber in order to illuminate the uh, chamber from the sides in order to make the tracks as visible as possible. Uh, we use in our chamber uh, isopropyl alcohol and we use a small syringe to dispense about one milliliter of that material into the uh, felt ring here that will be used uh, to uh, provide the alcohol for the inside of the cloud chamber. Uh, on the left side of the main box there's a power supply. This uh, is a standard computer uh, PC style power supply that produces uh, plus or minus 12 volts and plus or minus 5 volts at uh, amperages up to about 7 or 8 amperes which uh, is sufficient to uh, supply the necessary power to the thermoelectric device over here. Schematically, when it's all put together, it looks like this. The top of the chamber is at uh, close to room temperature, 20 degrees C or so. The bottom of the chamber has to be colder than about minus 25 degrees C in order to get the alcohol vapor to become supersaturated and display the um, ionizing tracks that uh, go through the device. Underneath the chamber you can see the uh, two Peltier plates. Peltier plates are the same as the thermoelectric plates. Uh, that, those are synonyms. And uh, below that you can see the heat sink that uh, is air-cooled uh, and uh, it's of the type that's normally purchased and used for uh, cooling CPUs in computers. You can also see some of the uh, support structures and insulating structures that we included to make the device work. You may be wondering what one of these thermoelectric units looks like. This is uh, one that um, is just like the ones that are underneath this uh, three inch diameter aluminum plate. These are uh, 40 millimeters by 40 millimeters square and they just take two leads, one uh, positive, one negative, 
and uh, they, the leads are connected to a power supply that uh, allows them to draw about um, 8 amperes. Uh, this device sits right underneath this plate and in our tests we were able to get a temperature of minus 30 degrees centigrade and that was achieved in uh, well under 5 minutes uh, after turning the device on. Using a thermocouple to measure the temperature at the uh, aluminum cooling plate where normally the bottom of the chamber would sit, we can see here uh, data showing a 50 degrees C temperature swing from room temperature down to uh, minus 31 degrees C with an exponential decay time or cooling time of 63 seconds. Let us now take the uh, parts of the cloud chamber and put them together to uh, take it into operation. I'll be wearing some black gloves in order to uh, avoid any possibility of contaminating my hands with the radioactive source. As a first step, uh, we take the felt ring that will provide the uh, liquid uh, vapor and uh, we will put about a milliliter of alcohol onto the felt. The exact amount is not relevant and uh, about one milliliter of alcohol is plenty for operating the chamber smoothly, continuously for at least half an hour. So that's the isopropyl alcohol. Then we take the body of the chamber and we put in it this uh, ring of clear plastic that allows or induces the smooth circulation of the vapor from the top where it's warmer to the bottom where it's cold and that ring simultaneously helps support the felt uh, at the top or the warm side of the cloud chamber. Then we take the lid and close the thing like so and uh, there's now a hole in the side into which we will insert the uh, radioactive source. The source is um, as mentioned, it's uh, lead 210, an extremely weak source. The material is actually on the head of uh, three sewing needles, which are pushed into a cork. And uh, that cork gets inserted into the side of the cloud chamber like so. And voila, the uh, cloud chamber is ready to uh, be put on the cooling plate to uh, be, uh, cool down to the operating temperature. Now that the body of the cloud chamber is ready to use, we uh, place it on this uh, cold surface, which uh, you'll recall is uh, cooled by a pair of thermoelectric plates that um, are underneath, and the heat that's being drawn from the cloud chamber is dissipated in a CPU uh, cooler device here that has a fan blowing across it to carry away the heat. So uh, all that uh, we have to do is uh, turn it on and that starts the cooling process which will result in tracks visible in about uh, three or four minutes. In the meantime we uh, place a uh, ring that we built that uh, has uh, some uh, LEDs uh, attached to the inside of it, that ring gets placed over top of the chamber like this in order to uh, illuminate it from the sides in order to make the tracks as visible as possible. And we plug that in and we get a nice illumination and uh, we are ready to go. All we have to do is uh, wait for the tracks to appear. While we're waiting for that to happen, let's take a look at what is expected uh, in the way of ionizing radiation from a lead 210 source. Lead 210 has a half-life of uh, 22 years, and uh, as a first step, it decays to bismuth 210. 
The um, beta particles produced in that decay are very low in energy and are not useful for uh, being visible in a cloud chamber. As a next step, the bismuth-210 decays into polonium-210. Uh, the beta particles here have um, a highest or so-called endpoint energy of 1.161 million electron volts. These um, beta particles are ionizing enough and energetic enough that they should produce some sort of tracks in the cloud chamber. The uh, final decay is for the uh, polonium-210 to decay into lead-206 by alpha decay. Now these alpha particles are highly ionizing and they have a single energy of 5.3 million electron volts and should therefore be easy, easily visible as tracks in the cloud chamber. So the chamber is working. It's uh, producing nice visible tracks in the chamber. As you can see, they um, are emanating from the uh, needles that are coated in the lead 210. Let's uh, watch for uh, a little while, and I invite you to see if you can distinguish two different types of tracks. So the straight or slightly curved tracks that you see in the chamber are due to alpha particles. Alphas have a range of about 3.8 centimeters in the gas and uh, the tracks are typically very sharp and clear if the tracks are formed in the supersaturated vapor directly and uh, they're somewhat puffy if the um, tracks were first formed uh, above the supersaturated layer and then uh, by the time the ions fall by convection into the supersaturated region, they've already spread out a little bit and form a slightly puffy track. The second category of tracks visible here are due to beta particles. Betas are energetic electrons. They are much lighter than alpha particles and they ionize the gas much less. Furthermore, they're much more easily deflected by collisions with uh, gas molecules. So you have to kind of look between the alpha tracks for short, very diffuse, very short typically tracks that disappear almost instantly. Those are the characteristic beta tracks. I will try to show you some better examples of that um, in upcoming clips. But here's a still photograph that um, shows you the uh, characteristic difference between an alpha track and a beta track. And here's another one that uh, shows the same thing. Here the indicated beta track is nearly impossible to see in the still photo, but uh, in the moving version it really shows up as uh, a track that appears and disappears again. Let us next look at uh, a different radioactive material. Uranium oxide is a material that's used uh, in glazes sometimes. It used to be uh, put on some material called Fiesta ware that you could buy as a household dinner ware uh, in the 1950s and 1960s. This material is uh, slightly radioactive. So what we're going to do is take a small chunk of uh, this Fiesta ware, uh, something that used to be a dinner plate, and we'll put it right in our uh, cloud chamber we will plug the hole of the cloud chamber uh, with a uh, cork and we are going to see what we can see from this piece of material. By the way, it was the orange colored Fiesta ware that used the uranium oxide as the ceramic glaze in products that were manufactured before 1972. Uranium-238 is the most common natural isotope of uranium and it is an alpha emitter uh, emitting a 4.37 MeV alpha particle 
and it also fissions, and the fission products in turn can produce alpha and beta particles. So here we are looking at the orange uranium oxide glaze from a fragment of vintage Fiesta ware. We can see long tracks that are due to the uh, alpha particles being emitted by the glaze, and we can see some short scraggly tracks which are quite likely to be the beta particles. You can also see that the tracks typically don't begin right at the surface of the glaze but typically a few millimeters away. I believe this occurs because the ceramic piece is not quite as cold as the rest of the chamber and therefore the gas is uh, not super saturated in the vicinity of the material itself. Now what we'll do next is um, put the same piece of uh, ceramic edge on so that um, hopefully we can see more tracks coming from the broad surface that uh, has the orange color. So here it is, the orange ceramic glaze viewed edge on. The white is the ceramic itself. It appears very white in uh, the uh, video here, so we don't really see the orange glaze, but we clearly see the uh, alpha and possibly the beta tracks emanating from both surfaces on, on both sides of the chunk of material. The um, next material that we'll take a look at is um, strontium-90. Strontium-90 is a beta emitter that will be placed either in or next to the chamber. The source is in the form of a uh, small button of plastic with a small pin head size amount of uh, strontium-90 uh, embedded in it. and. Uh, we'll Put that in the cloud chamber or next to the cloud chamber and we'll take a look at what the beta particles from that material look like. As for what we should expect, uh, strontium-90 decays uh, with a half-life of uh, about uh, 29 years in two steps. First it decays to yttrium-90 with the uh, emission of beta particles of energies up to 0.546 MeV and uh, those uh, yttrium nuclei decay rapidly, uh, half-life of 64 hours, to zirconium-90 with the emission of uh, betas up to 2.28 MeV. This makes strontium-90 a common and popular source for comparatively high energy beta particles. So here is the strontium source sitting inside the chamber. The white rectangle at the bottom is the source and the betas are being shot upward in the uh, image. Furthermore, the uh, video has been sped up by a factor of three to try to make it somewhat easier to see the faint hazy tracks that uh, are permeating the entire chamber in this uh, situation. The um, ionization of beta particles is so much less than the ionization of the alpha particles that um, seeing the beta tracks is very much a challenge in this type of device. If you're skeptical whether I was showing you real tracks in the previous clip or not, here's what the chamber looks like when it's totally free of ionizing sources. Apart from cosmic rays, of which there are very few, there are no alpha tracks here, there are no beta tracks here, it's a quiescent device. Now we'll really go out on a limb and see whether we can see anything in the cloud chamber due to gamma rays. Gamma rays are uncharged, and so they don't ionize the gas in the same way that um, an alpha particle or a beta particle uh, does when it passes through the gas. However, a gamma ray can ionize a, uh, an atom in the gas and thereby produce an electron that carries the energy of the incoming gamma ray. So for this uh, test, our source will be uh, sodium-22. Sodium-22, with a half-life of about 2.6 years, uh, 
can uh, electron capture to neon 22 produce a 1.274 MeV gamma ray and then in turn that gamma ray can photoionize the gas and uh, perhaps give a signal. Also sodium 22 does uh, positron emission. The positrons annihilate with uh, any electrons they can find in the source and uh, thereby they produce uh, 0.511 MeV gamma rays which in principle can also ionize the chamber gas and show an effect. Here's the source lying on the lid of the uh, cloud chamber. The source is that little dot at the center of the plastic disc. We really couldn't see any effect of the uh, source when it was sitting in this position, so we moved it to the upper edge of the chamber. And here it is. We uh, now can see sort of a froth that is permeating the chamber, similar to what we saw before with the strontium-90 source. This uh, video is speeded up by a factor of three, like before, to make it easier to see the uh, many, many small blips of uh, tracks that are evident now due to the uh, photoionization of the gas by the gamma rays from the sodium-22 source sitting outside the chamber. If in real life you were to get your eye really close to the cloud chamber, you would see that these hazy tracks are actually beautiful little spider webby trails of individual trails due to individual electrons. One event that we were especially happy to capture is um, this one in which um, an alpha particle, uh, track A, that has a kinetic energy less than 5 MeV ends up uh, scattering from a nucleus in the uh, vapor. Now that nucleus could be an air uh, molecule of uh, nitrogen or oxygen or possibly um, a hydrogen that's part of the alcohol. The uh, alpha particle gets deflected um, by about 30 degrees as you can see uh, diagrammatically at point B. This is an example of Rutherford scattering which uh, is the phenomenon of um, Coulomb repulsion between the alpha particle and the target nucleus deflecting uh, the nucleus uh, and the uh, alpha particle. In fact, in this example, at point C, you can see that the struck nucleus recoils with enough kinetic energy to leave a stubby trail of its own. Finally, at point D, you can see that the um, alpha particle scatters one more time just before it finally comes to rest in the gas. So here's the still image of this event. Once you understand what's going on here, you look at this and you can really only say, wow, that's quite beautiful. Once you uh, see it in a still, here it is in motion. Once, twice, three times. Very pretty. We are reaching the end of our presentation, but uh, if you're curious, here is a price list of the main components of the cloud chamber that you've seen demonstrated. The um, total is about $286, and uh, in 2017, when the um, minimum wage in most of America was about $10 an hour, you can uh, judge for yourself the uh, true cost of building such a device. Thank you.